Let me introduce you to the bandit queen herself, Belle Star. Belle Star, the notorious outlaw, had a fascinating and tumultuous life filled with adventure and tragedy. Born as Myra Bell Shirley in a log cabin near Carthage, Missouri on February 5th of 1848, she grew up in a family with a colorful past. Her father, Judge John Shirley, was a bit of a rebel from a wealthy Virginia family who had moved west and married three times. Bell's mother, Elizabeth Pennington, hailed from the feuding Hatfields and McCoy family. In her early years, Bell enjoyed a privileged upbringing, attending the Carthage Female Academy. She was a bright student and excelled in music and classical languages. Despite her refined education, Bell also had a mischievous streak and showed love of her status as the rich girl. She embraced the outdoors, spending days exploring the countryside with her older brother Bud, who taught her how to ride horses and handle a gun. Bell's life took a dramatic turn when the Kansas-Missouri border war erupted. This war tore communities apart, forcing people to take sides and actually turning neighbors into enemies. Bell's brother Bud joined Quantrill's Raiders, a band of Confederate guerrillas. He actually served as a scout and achieved the rank of captain. But Bud was killed in June of 1864, and it was a devastating loss to the family, which led them to face financial hardships due to the raids that happened during the war, and Bell's father decided to sell their property in Missouri and move down to Texas. It was in Texas that Bell's path crossed with some of the most notorious outlaws of this time. The famous James Younger Gang, which included Jesse and Frank James, arrived in Texas after robbing their first bank in Liberty, Missouri. Bell was immediately drawn to Cole Younger and became infatuated with him. Even with all this, she actually married another man named Jim Reed, who she had known back in Missouri. They settled in Texas, initially living with Bell's family before moving to Missouri where they had two children. Although, rumors circulated that Bell had another relationship with Cole Younger and actually bore his child, even though there's not any evidence to support this case. Bell's marriage to Jim Reed was okay with her family. He wasn't a wanted man yet. <laughs> but uh, Reed's outlaw activity actually caught up with him, and he was killed in a gunfight in 1874, and that left Bell a widow with two young children, and she took to the outlaw trail. During her time as an outlaw, Bell became involved with seven different outlaws, including Blue Duck and eventually Sam Starr, a Cherokee. Bell and Sam settled down on a farm in Oklahoma which Bells named Younger's Bend in honor of Cole Younger. They formed their own gang and engaged in wrestling, horse stealing, and bootlegging whiskey to Native Americans. Bell's intelligence and careful planning earned her the reputation as the brains behind the operation. Bell's criminal activity did not go unnoticed, and she repeatedly found herself in conflict with the law. Judge Isaac Park, known as, quote, the hanging judge, pretty terrifying if you're an outlaw, uh, was determined to bring Belle to justice. Although she was arrested multiple times, she often evaded conviction due to lack of evidence. Belle's life took another tragic turn when Sam Starr was killed in a gunfight. Soon after, Belle entered into her third marriage with a much younger outlaw, a man named Jim July. Their relationship was stormy and there were actually reports of domestic violence. It is believed that July even attempted to have Belle killed. Ultimately, Bell Starr met her end on February 3rd of 1889 when she was ambushed and shot to death on a country road at the age of 41. Her death sparked an investigation and several suspects were questioned, including her husband Jim July, her son Ed, her daughter Pearl, and a neighbor named Watson. The circumstances surrounding Bell's death remain somewhat mysterious, with rumors of family discord possibly incestuous relationships, possibly, uh, and conflicts over marriage alliances. It's very shady, very mysterious. Bell was laid to rest in the front yard of her cabin at Younger's Bend. Her daughter Pearl later had a monument erected over her grave featuring an image of Bell's favorite horse, Venus. Pretty cool name. The inscription on the stone expresses a sentiment that Bell's spirit still shone bright despite the loss of her physical form. Belle Star's life was filled with adventure, danger, and tragedy. She embraced the life of an outlaw, became an iconic figure of the Wild West, 
and left behind a legacy that still captivates the fans like us of the Wild West to this day. Ann Bassett, a remarkable rancher with a fiery spirit, commanded attention amidst the rugged landscapes of Browns Hole, Colorado. Nestled near the border of Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah, this isolated region possessed an air of lawlessness, beckoning outlaws and renegades like moths to a flame. It stood as a notorious haven for horse thieves, cattle rustlers, and notorious outlaws of the area, rivaling the infamous hideouts of Hole in the Wall, Wyoming, and Robber's Roost in Utah. Here, amid the untamed wilderness, Anne's story unfolded. Born on May 12th of 1878 to parents Herb and Elizabeth Chamberlain Bassett, they presided over a ranch that epitomized both the isolation and allure of the area. Their humble abode perched on the edge of the wild frontier, welcoming danger and adventure with open arms. Her father Herb, a man unassuming yet harboring hidden connections, conducted business with outlaws who straddled the blurred lines between lawlessness and legend. Among his acquaintances were the infamous Butch Cassidy, the audacious Harvey Kid Curry Logan, and an enigmatic Black Jack Ketchum. Through horse trades, beef sales, and provisional transactions, Herb danced on the fringes of legitimacy, his activities serving as a lifeline to those living on the wild side. Despite the untamed nature of the surroundings, the Bassett sisters, Anne and Josie, exuded a rare elegance that bellied their rustic upbringing. These fetching young women received education befitting of the highest echelons of society, attending esteemed boarding schools that cultivated their intelligence and grace. Yet, their father Herb instilled into them practical skills that set them apart from their refined peers. They mastered the arts of riding and roping and shooting and became adept at the ways of the untamed frontier. It was within this vivid tapestry of wild beauty and uncharted possibilities that Anne and Josie encountered the legendary outlaws, Butch Cassidy and his audacious gang, the Wild Bunch. Drawn to the sisters' radiant allure, their intelligence, and the articulate voices, these outlaws found solace in company with the companionship of Anne and Josie. At the tender age of 15, Anne, too, succumbed to the allure of Butch Cassidy's charismatic presence, embarking on a passionate romance that defied societal norms. Meanwhile, Josie found herself entangled with Elza Lay, further weaving the threads of love and adventure into their lives. Even the outlaws Ben Kilpatrick and Will News Carver, later infamous members of the Wild Bunch gang, courted the captivating Bassett sisters drawn by their irresistible charm. Amidst the backdrop of their unconventional lifestyle, Anne's father, a man content to fade into the background, entrusted the ranch's operations to Elizabeth, Anne's indomitable mother. Faced with encroaching cattle barons who sought to seize control of Brown's Hole, Elizabeth, driven by her own feud with these powerful men, dabbled in a touch of cattle rustling. An audacious act of defiance, it earned her the title Queen of the Rustlers, amongst those who whispered her name in hushed tones. As Anne grew into her own, she embraced her mother's righteous fury, directing it squarely at the two-bar ranch, a symbol of the oppressive cattle barons. Her actions spoke louder than her words, and she liberally helped herself to their prized cattle, becoming a thorn in the side of those who sought to dominate the untamed frontier. Whispers and accusations painted a darker portrait of Anne in her mother's defiance. Rumors swirled that they sent two bar cattle hurtling off treacherous cliffs in an act of spiteful revenge. These tales reached the ears of the cattle barons, their wrath demanding action. It was then that they employed the services of Tom Horn, a man who possessed the reputation as a formidable as the mountains that cradle Brown's Hole. Tasked with infiltrating this wild domain, Horn set forth on a mission to silence the defiant voices that refused to yield. When Matt Rush, Isom Dart, and other ranchers stood their ground, their resolve unyielding, Horn resorted to violence. His bullets felled those who dared challenge his authority, their lives cut short amid the echoing canyons and vast expanse of Brown's Hole. In a twist of fate, Anne's path veered towards marriage with H. Bernard, the manager of Two Bar Ranch, sparking a storm of controversy. 
Their union ignited a powder keg of tension, resulting in Bernard's swift dismissal from his post. For six years, their relationship stood as a testament to the complexities of love amid the wild frontier. Yet, Anne's spirit remained untamed, her rebellious nature compelling her to snatch cattle from the fairy ranch she had married into, a defiant act that would forever etch her name into the annals of infamy. When she faced trial for her audacity, the courtroom drama unfolded, gripping the hearts and minds of all who witnessed it. Ultimately, Anne emerged from the crucible of justice, acquitted and unscathed, her resilience an enduring testament to her domital spirit. In 1928, Anne embarked on a new chapter of her life, bidding farewell to the rugged landscapes that had shaped her existence. She wed a man named Frank Willis, who brought stability and a sense of settling to her tumultuous journey. Together, they brought solace in a small town nestled in the southwestern reaches of Utah, where the vast horizons whispered a quieter existence. There, Anne found respite from her windswept drama of her youth, cultivating a peaceful existence that would carry her through the twilight of her life. Though some sought to intertwine her story with that of Etta Place, an elusive figure of the Wild West, historians have largely dismissed such claims, allowing Anne Bassett to etch her name in as a singular force in the annals of frontier history. And so at the age of, of 78, Anne departed this world, leaving behind a legacy that would forever illuminate the untamed spirit that thrived within the heart of the American West. Ellen Liddy Watson, known as Cattle Kate, was an extraordinary woman whose life unfolded against the backdrop of the untamed Old West. Born in July of 1860, her story is one of resilience, tragedy, and a relentless fight for justice. As the daughter of Thomas Lewis Watson and Frances Close, she grew up in Gray County, Ontario, where her family faced the challenges of a rugged existence. Ellen was the eldest of 10 siblings, and from an early age, she shouldered responsibilities both at home and at school. In 1877, the Watson family embarked on a new chapter, leaving their familiar surroundings behind and settling in Lebanon, Kansas. It was there that Ellen's path diverged from her family when she ventured to Smith Center to work as a cook and housekeeper for H.R. Stone. It was in the Smith Center that Ellen's life took a dramatic turn. She encountered William A. Pickle, a farm laborer, and against her better judgment, she married him on November 24th of 1879. The wedding portrait that survives captured Ellen's towering presence, a tall, square-faced woman standing about 5 foot 8 inches, weighing approximately 165 pounds. Her striking appearance with brown hair, piercing blue eyes, and a hint of her Scottish heritage in her accent painted a picture of strength and determination. Unfortunately, Ellen's marriage to Pickle quickly turned into a nightmare. He subjected her to verbal and physical abuse, often lashing out with a horsewhip. In January of 1883, Ellen fled from her tormentor and sought refuge at her parents' home. Pickle pursued her, but was ultimately scared off by her father, ensuring that they would never cross paths again. Ellen made her way to Red Cloud, Nebraska, just 12 miles from her family's homestead, where she found solace and worked at the Royal Hotel. It was during this time that she established her residency and filed for divorce, seeking liberation from the shackles of an abusive relationship. Against her family's wishes, Ellen ventured to Denver, Colorado to join her brother, who had settled there. From Denver, she embarked on a solitary journey that led her to the rugged lands of Cheyenne, Wyoming. In a time when independent women were a rarity, Ellen defied the convention and sought work as a seamstress and cook. Although Cheyenne didn't capture Ellen's heart, fate intervened in late 1885 or early 1886 when she followed the railroads to Rawlings, Wyoming. It was there, amidst the vast expanse of frontier, that Ellen found herself working as a cook and waitress in the prestigious Rawlins House, the premier boarding house in town. On a cold winter's day of February 24th in 1886, the small towns of Rollins buzzed with the sound of clinking spurs and lively chatter. Among the rugged cowboys and weary travelers, a fateful encounter took place that would change the course of Ellen Watson's life forever. James Jim Averill, 
a man with a rugged demeanor and adventurous spirit arrived in Rollins. His eyes set on claiming a piece of untamed land along the enchanting Sweetwater River. Avril wasted no time in establishing his presence, opening a rustic restaurant and a humble general store that beckoned to cowboys and wanderers embarking on the treacherous trails leading westward. It didn't take long for the aroma of sizzling steaks and fresh brewed coffee to lure Ellen Watson, a woman of remarkable culinary talent, into Avril's bustling eatery. Mesmerized by tantalizing flavors in the vibrant atmosphere, Watson's heart quickened with the possibilities that lay before her. Avril, recognizing her exceptional skill, wasted no time in extending an offer to the town to cook to join his establishment. Watson, yearning for independence and seeking an escape from the mundane, readily accepted. As the days grew warmer and the promise of spring filled the air, the couple's relationship blossomed. In May, a bold decision was made as Watson and Avril embarked on a journey traversing the rugged terrain for a hundred miles in search of a marriage license. The dusty town of Lander, Wyoming became a fleeting sanctuary of hope and anticipation as their paperwork was processed. The marriage license bearing the name Ellen Liddy Andrews served as a whisper of commitment, although it legally remained uncertain. Legends and tales have been woven around their union, shrouding their bond in a veil of secrecy. With their unspoken marriage, Watson discovered a newfound opportunity, a key to unlock her dreams. The Homestead Act of 1862 beckoned to her, tantalizing her with the prospect of owning 160 acres of land, providing that she made it her own within five years. It was a chance, but one that eluded married women. Thus, the secret union with Avril ensured that Watson's eligibility to claim the land that awaited for her was just beyond the reach of Oregon, Mormon, and California trails. In the sweltering heat of August of 1886, Watson's determined spirit materialized as she filed squatter's rights to the land adjacent to Avril's. The vast expanse of untouched wilderness lay before her, a blank canvas awaiting her touch. But it was May of 1888 that Watson seized her destiny with unwavering resolve, formally filing her homestead claim to the coveted piece of land. To satisfy the demands of the Homestead Act, a modest yet sturdy cabin emerged, standing as a testament to her tenacity while a sturdy crowd welcomed the prospect of livestock. With her hard-earned savings, Ellen Watson embarked on a daring endeavor that would shape her future. Immigrants trudging along the treacherous trails, weary from their journey, became her gateway to a burgeoning cattle enterprise. She carefully negotiated deals, acquiring cattle from these weary travelers, establishing the foundations of her ambitions. However, her 60-acre fenced land, adorned with barbed wire, proved insufficient to sustain her modest herd. In the vast expanse of the American West, ranchers roamed in cattle grazed freely on public land, so Watson was faced with a daunting challenge. In the year of 1872, a powerful alliance was born. The Wyoming Stock Growers Association, or WSGA, emerged, a formidable force forged by two dozen influential cattlemen with vast ranches. Their collective aim was to safeguard their rights to the open range, ensuring that cattle thrived under the expansive skies. The harsh snow winter of 1880 and 81 dealt a devastating blow to these ranchers, burying their livestock under towering snowdrifts. It was in the wake of this catastrophe that ranchers, including Watson, sought alternatives to sustain their cattle through the harsh winter months. The cultivation of hay became their lifestyle, demanding access to water for its successful growth, a vital resource that now held the key to the survival. Nestled amidst the enchanting landscape claimed by Watson and Avril, a shimmering ribbon of life flowed. Horse Creek, a precious mile of rippling water that coursed through their domain. It promised sustenance and prosperity, an invaluable asset in the realm of ranching. But the allure of the open range came with its own set of challenges, cloaked in laws and regulation that dictated the fate of those who dared to defy its boundaries. In a realm of unbranded calves became the property of WSGA, Watson found herself ensnared in the clutches of this powerful association. 
the cattleman's iron grip tightened its hold, systematically marginalizing smaller ranches through restrictive auction practices and the demand for registered brands. The crazy cost of branding and gatekeeping of exclusivity locked away the dreams and aspirations of ranchers. The fate of brands lay in the hands of a committee swayed by the whims and biases of the Cattlemen's Association, effectively silencing the voices of those who dared to challenge the status quo. Watson and Avril persisted in their pursuit. They, they faced repeated rejection as they filed brand application, each denial a blow to their hopes and aspirations. Yet, within the obstacles, a silver opportunity emerged. In a twist of fate, Watson acquired a previously registered L.U., its altered pronunciation, a whispered tribute to her own name, Ella. With the ebbs and flows of triumph and setbacks, a man named Albert John Boothwell cast his eyes upon Watson and Avril's land. As the embodiment of wealth and power, Boothwell, despite his claim to land beyond his own, his own property, repeatedly sought to seduce them with huge offers. Yet, they weren't deterred by the riches that Boothwell was throwing their way. The couple clung to their dreams, refusing to yield the hard-won domain to the temptations that swirled around them. Empowered by her newfound brand, Watson embarked on a pivotal moment of her journey. In July of 1889, as her witness, the branding iron seared the flesh of her cattle, making them her own. 41 cattle, bearing the scars of her ownership, became the testament to her resilience, a symbol of her perseverance amidst the adversity she had faced. It was in pursuit of securing her livelihood that Watson, perhaps unknowingly, stepped on the toes of fate. Filed for approval to construct a water ditch, a conduit that would breathe life into her parched lands. Little did she know that her actions would ignite a powder keg of retaliation and retribution. Again, Albert John Boothwell, the jealous neighbor, a man whose own grasp of legal and land ownership was tenuous at best saw Watson's audacious move as a direct challenge to his dominion. Defying the law himself by fencing off public land, he retaliated by encroaching upon Ella's cherished domain. His cowboys dispatched as agents of torment and harassment. Oblivious to the peril that lurked on the horizon, Watson and Avril remained blissfully unaware of the storm brewing in their midst. On July 20th, 1889, a day etched in infamy for this area, it would witness the darkest chapters of their life. A nefarious plot was set in motion, orchestrated by their neighbor Boothwell and a handful of ranchers whom he had coerced into a sinister web. In an act of shocking betrayal, they descended on the couple's homestead, their intentions veiled with a veneer of authority. At gunpoint, they forced Ella onto a buckboard, her life hanging on by a thread, as she was falsely accused of cattle rustling. Rollins, a town that had witnessed ebbs and flows of hopes and dreams, became the stage of an unspeakable act of violence. Gene Crowder, a witness to the unfolding tragedy, rode for help, racing against time to alert their friend, Frank Buchanan, of the impendent horror. Gunshots punctured the air, the defiant outcry of Buchanan's resistance, yet it was futile struggle against the overwhelming tide of darkness. Both Jim and Ella, their spirits unbroken, but their bodies shackled by an inescapable grip of fate, were callously hanged by the hands of those who once shared the vast expanse of the open range with them. In the aftermath of these heinous acts, the anguish reverberated through the hearts of those who told the tale of Ella Watson's tragic demise. Her spirit, forever entwined in the untamed landscape she had sought to conquer, serving as stark reminder of the perils that befell the daring souls who challenged the established order. County Sheriff Frank Hadzel was determined to bring justice to the innocent victims. Accompanied by Deputy Sheriff Phil Watson, a man unrelated to Ella but still wanted to bring justice to innocent people, both apprehended Albert Boothwell, the crazy neighbor, and his cohorts, five men stained with the blood of the innocent. People were hopeful that a trial would bring them to justice, but there was a weird feeling of the wind. Gene Crowder, the key witness and the man who rode for help during the hanging, 
just vanished. Same thing with a man named John DeCorey. He was a cute, crucial figure to the trial, and he just disappeared. Frank Buchanan, the man who Gene Crowder rode for help, also just disappeared. There's The papers didn't know, the town didn't know, just whispers. Albert Boothwell, the orchestrator of the heinous acts that stained the soil of Rawlins, Wyoming, seemed to evade the clutches of justice. He claimed dominion over the homesteads of the victims and kind of usurped their legacy without facing any legal consequences that should have rightfully hit him. Albert Boothwell's audacity led him to running his ranch unscathed and his actions are a grim reminder of the imbalance of power that reigned in those lawless territories. It was only with his eventual retirement to Los Angeles, where he died in the 1920s, that the shadow finally lifted. Amidst the aftermath of the tragedy and the chilling silence that settled over land, a different narrative began to emerge. A twist of fate intended to justify the brutality inflicted upon Ella and Avril unfolded within the pages of the Cheyenne Daily Sun and other publications controlled by the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. The myth of Cattle Kate Maxwell, a prostitute and cattle rustler, was born from the ink that stained those papers. Editor Ed Taus, with his 1,300-word article, wove a tale that justified the grisly act of lynching and glorified the violence perpetrated by the cattlemen. The press became their tool, painting a distorted image of the victims as the cattlemen revealed the public condemnation of those they deemed thieves as well. It was a dance of power, a narrative that would be resurrected years later during the violent clashes in 1891 and 1892. Yet, amidst the darkness, voices of truth did emerge. Testaments to the character of Ella Watson. Harry Ward, a stage station operator who knew her well, described her as a woman of remarkable presence, possessing a beauty that transcended the surface. He spoke of her with compassion, her generous spirit that extended to those in need, refusing to let anyone go hungry in her presence. The words of those who knew her echoed through the corridors of time, painting a portrait of a woman who defied societal norms and held a heart longer than a vast expanse of Wyoming landscape. Ella Watson's fate, sealed by a hangman's loose, forever branded her as the only woman to face such a brutal end in Wyoming. Her tragic demise, intertwined with that of Avril, became a symbol of the contempt and disregard that society held for rustlers during the tumultuous era. For decades, the myth of Cattle Kate Maxwell persisted until the latter part of the 20th century, when composer George Huffsmith embarked on a journey to unearth the truth. His research, fueled by revelations shared by Watson's own family, led to a biography that brought Ella Watson out of the shadows of distortion and into the light of truth. Through his efforts, the Cattle Kate myth began to crumble, revealing the woman behind the legend, her story etched with resilience and defiance. In 1989, a marker was erected at Ella Watson's gravesite by her devoted relatives, a solemn tribute to honor her memory and acknowledge the injustice she endured. It stood as a testament to her life and a reminder to the dark chapter in Wyoming's history. Ella Watson's legacy endures a symbol of resilience and a testament to the fight against injustice. Her memory serves as a reminder that echoes of the past, however distorted, can be unraveled and unwritten, restoring the truth and honoring the lives that history has sought to bury.